All right, well, thanks so much for joining this video presentation on problem solving fun with Mystery Skype. Um, for those of you that are joining, Joining live, I just got to say hello to several of you, so hello again. Um, for those of you that are watching on the recording, thank you so much for finding it. Um, of course, you can find more recordings and more live presentations by going to q.org slash Microsoft. Um, that's the easiest way to find any of the new sessions and any of the recordings. So in this session, we're going to be talking about Mystery Skype. It's this fun activity that you can do with your students to help introduce them to the world around them, to help them to meet new people. Um, problem solving, there's geography, there's all sorts of good things when it comes to um, Mystery Skype. So um, yeah, lots of things that we'll be able to talk about. And I know that I'm, I'm pretty certain that there's there's gotta be some of you that have um, done some Mystery Skype calls before or have learned some stuff about it. So. Um, if you've got anything to add, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat. So um, please feel free to ask questions, uh, throw in your experiences, throw in any resources or any ideas that you've got because um, you know, we're better together whenever we, we all share things. So um, I'm going to refer to several resources in this presentation, but I thought I'd share this one with you first, ditchthattextbook.com slash connect. Um, these are some links and resources to the kinds of things that, um, the kinds of things that, <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. These are links and resources to the kinds of things we're going to talk about in this presentation. That's what I was trying to say. Um, so, a lot of the stuff that we refer to, there will be additional resources about those right there. So I'm already seeing in the comments that Nikki has done some mystery Skype. So I may be lean, leaning on you for um, some some ideas and some um, you know some additional perspective and resources and everything. So um, so feel free to go check out that link if you want to. I've been presenting on mystery Skype for years. Um, I did this. Um, gosh, it's been almost what six or seven or eight years ago was when I did my first mystery Skype in my own classroom. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a little bit. And um, it's been so, so fun to, to just kind of see other people continue to, to pick up on it more and more. So, but I thought that we might try an actual mystery Skype game to start this out. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to give this a try. Um, so the idea behind Mystery Skype, of course, is that um, it's like this global guessing game, right? And so usually what you do, I'm going to turn my uh, screen off real quick so that you can see me. Um, so what you usually do in a Mystery Skype game is... Um, you have these two classes on video on a video call together and you know one class of kids is looking at the projector of the other class and the other class is looking at the one and they see each other smiling faces but they have no idea where geographically the other class is and so they ask these yes and no questions back and forth to try to figure out where the other class is and so this class will ask a question to that class and they'll answer and then this class will ask a question to that class and then they'll answer and they go back and forth as they narrow it down narrow it down narrow it down narrow it down until eventually one of the classes is able to guess where the other one is so um i thought that we might try a version of that with all of you um being the question askers and me being the question answerer. Now, usually in a traditional mystery Skype game, it would be two classes asking each other questions back and forth, back and forth, but there's a whole bunch of you and there's one of me. And I thought, you know, this might be a little easier way to, to kind of um, replicate it. So um, I put a link up on the screen um, and, and I know that I took the, took my screen share off. So I'm just going to type it into the chat. Um, it is mapchart.com, no, mapchart.net slash usa.html. So I just put it into the chat. And if you want to click on that link, um, let me show you what you can find whenever you go there. And I'm going to go back to screen share real quick. I found this a little while back, and I thought this was the coolest thing. So um, and it could be a really nice um resource whenever you're doing mystery Skype calls. So 
Here, let's do it again. Map chart.net slash usa.html. And there is a world.html if you want to do a world map. But I figured we would just do the um, do a United States um, mystery Skype game. So, and it looks like, you know, there's a handful of you that are from Canada. So if you'll bear with me on my, uh, <laughs> on my USA focus here, but um, what we can do is with this map, I wanted to show this to you real quick because um, what happens in a mystery Skype game is as the kids ask a question, as they ask a yes or no question, um, what happens is they're able to mark uh, uh, states or countries off of the map because they know that they've ruled them out. And what's neat about this mapchart.net is that you can click on a state and you can turn it a color. And so if I need to toggle on or off several, and you've got to right click to remove the color, but if you click on it, it turns the color on. You see how I just removed all of those. But um, this is kind of a neat thing to be able to toggle states on and off as you guess them. So if you want to have that going in a separate tab, um, you can always jump over and use that. Or if you don't want to use it with this call, then you can always just you know file that away for the future to be able to use with students. So uh, Nikki says, I used a P I used a P PDF with an annotation feature. I feel ancient. Oh no, that's a good that's a good idea. Um, in fact, I've seen teachers laminate maps and have used dry erase markers or you know those little grease pencils um, to be able to mark off states as they guess them or mark off countries as they guess them. So um, anyway, there's what that looks like. And so what we're going to do real quick is we're going to actually play a mystery Skype game. So what I'm going to do is. Instead of using the state that I am in, I'm going to use a different state. And I'm going to pretend like I'm in that state and I'm gonna let you all guess, um, ask me the questions. And so I'll kind of take them as we go. Now, before we start asking questions, let me give you a couple of ground rules. Number one, the question has to be a yes or no. Lori says a state of mind. <laughs> oh, that would be really complicated to try to answer, I think. <laughs> um, so anyway, like I was saying, a couple of ground rules. Number one, it has to be a yes or no question. So you can't say, is your state to the north or to the south of something? That's an either or question. Um, is it, well, that's a yes or no question. It, it has to be, you know, it can't be either or, it can't be one of three, like what time zone is it? As sometimes people will want to ask. Um, you can't just ask what time zone are you in? You have to ask a specific one because that's a yes or a no question. Um, so that's one. And the best questions, I'll tell you this too, um, the best questions are the ones that eliminate a large chunk of the states, whether it's a yes or a no answer. So for instance, if we were doing a global mystery Skype and someone asked, are you in the Western hemisphere? That's a good, um, that's a good question because whether it's a yes or a no, you're eliminating half of the world. So, um, so anyway, those are just a couple of um, a couple of things. Um, I'm starting to already see a couple of questions here, so I probably better go ahead and turn it over to all of you to start asking. So, um, Nikki threw about 500 questions out there. No, I'm just kidding. It was only like three or four, but um, yeah. So if you have like one specific one, then go ahead and, and fire it away. Okay. So here's the first one. I'm gonna take. Um, Let's see, Minna said, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, are you in the Pacific time zone? Are you in the Pacific time zone? And I'm gonna say on that one, in the state that I've picked, no, I am not in the Pacific time zone. So that means that you can cross off all of the states that are in the Pacific time zone. So I'll do one of those up here too. I'm gonna guess, because I don't live in the Pacific time zone. So I'm just going to guess, does it go over to about there? You all can tell me if Arizona, Utah. Actually, I'm not even convinced that Nevada. Is it Nevada or Nevada? I don't know. I'm asking lots of questions. Okay, here's the next one. Um, Kristen asks, are you in the Eastern time zone? Now, the answer for me as a person would be yes, but remember, I'm just picking another state to, to be a part of. So I'm going to say no to that one. Am I in the Eastern time zone? 
No, because see, here's where I really am. I'm really in Indiana, but remember I picked a different state. So um, am I in the Eastern time zone? And the answer there is no, I'm not gonna click all of these little bitty states over here. So I'll just do that and we'll just remember that all of these are ruled out as well, okay? All right, good. What's another question? Is your state east of the Mississippi River? Ah, see, Nikki just asked probably the most common mystery Skype question, which is to using the Mississippi River as a, um, using it as a dividing line and then um, asking, are you east or are you west? So in this case, she asked, are, is your state east of the Mississippi River? And to that, I would say, no, my state is not east of the Mississippi River. So we'll rule a few more out there. What else have we got? Does your state begin with the letter A, Yvette says? And see if we look through here, we can see of the ones that are remaining, we've got one, two, three states that start with the letter A. So that one, I have to say no, my state does not begin with the letter A. So we're gonna cross those letter A's off. There we go. Okay, so get a good look at the states that are left. And remember, the best questions are the ones that um, are the ones that eliminate a large chunk of questions, whether it's a yes or a no. Oh my goodness, this is a great question. This looks like Mr. Is the Saisayana saying, "Is your state a regular polygon?" Oh my goodness, I love this question because now we're starting to get a little cross curricular, aren't we? Um, we're getting into some some math, pulling some math into our mystery Skype game. This is wonderful. Um, so, is your state a regular polygon? I would say. Yes, my state is a regular polygon. So what can we rule out? I would say the ones that are organically shaped, right? Somebody correct me if I interpreted that one wrong. Missouri definitely is organically shaped. Iowa is, Minnesota is. These guys are all pretty close. I think New Nebraska has enough of a curve in it. I don't know, Montana, Idaho. I think those are pretty close to polygons, right? Okay, let's see what else. Uh, Nikki asks, is your state landlocked is my state landlocked and the answer to that is yes my state is landlocked now i can't really see from here for of all of the states that are landlocked we know that these are up here now forgive me remember i live up here so i can't remember if this little part of new mexico i think that's connected to mexico that's not connected to the gulf of mexico so i think we're good i forgot arizona oh and then i got it okay yep uh, Lori asked, does your state border a foreign country? The answer to that one is no, my state does not border a foreign country. So we can turn off North Dakota and New Mexico. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five states left. If you can ask a question that eliminates two or three states, whether it's a yes or a no, those are the best ones. Okay. Who's got another question for me? And whenever we get closer to the end here, this is where it starts to get, um, this is where it starts to get more creative, where you have to get really creative with your questions. Uh, let's see, oh, this is a good one. Okay, so John just asked, is your state part of the four corners? And of course the four corners is this part right here where all, all of these four states all match up right there in those four corners. And this is a great question because we only have five states left. If it's a yes, then we've narrowed it down to two. And if it's no, it's down to three. So it's kind of like, you know, you eliminate half of the states with it's yes or no question. So that's good. So the answer to this, is my state part of the four corners? The answer is yes, it is. So since it's part of the four corners, I can eliminate Kansas, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And now we're down to Utah or Colorado. Um, so we're down to, um, ah, so we're down to two states. And so now we've got a question as teachers to figure out, um, that question is, do we want students to guess when there are two states left or do we want them to ask one more question and narrow it down to the one? That's kind of like a philosophical question that any teacher that uses mystery Skype has to sort of figure out on their own is, um, do they, do they want to let them guess? Uh, Nikki says, I made my students ask a question. So in her case, 
She doesn't just let them guess. She makes them ask another question and they're out down. So that's what I'm going to do with all of you. And I've seen several good questions here. Does your state have four sides? Is your state west of Nebraska? Does your state have a two-word name? Well, that one that one would have been great earlier, but that got ruled out. Um, does your state border Nevada? Is Denver in your state? Is marijuana legal? <laughs> does your state start with a vowel? Um, yeah, all of those are good. Let's go with the, the last one that I've got on the list, which is does your state start with a vowel? And the answer to that one is no. My state does not start with a vowel. And so we've narrowed it down. What's my state? This is the part where I, I always turn to the group that I'm with or the kids that I'm with, and I'd say, whenever they're, it's time to guess, I say, hey, we guess that you're in the state of, and then they all yell, it looks like some of you are doing it, Colorado. That's right. I am in, I'm pretending to be in Colorado. And there's actually a reason that I'm pretending to be in Colorado. I get to go on a hiking trip in the uh, Rocky Mountains in about a week and a half with my brother-in-law and a bunch of bunch of other folks. So um, pretty excited about that. So I thought, yeah, that's probably a good state for me to guess or for me to choose. So, um, so there you go. There's sort of an initial um, entry into the mystery Skype world. So hopefully that was an enjoyable one for you. Um, but that kind of gives you a feel for how the um, how it works, right? Um, so, so let's kind of dive into this a little bit and get some more, get a little bit more information about it and continue to learn a little bit more about this game, this mystery Skype. And, um, by the way, the geography version of mystery Skype that we just played is not the only version. This works, um, from all the way down from the littles up to the bigs to some extent, there are different variations that you can have. Um, I know with, um, with my kids, I taught high school Spanish, and my high schoolers love playing Mystery Skype, especially since we played in Spanish. And so it was a good fit for my class. So there's lots lots of ways that we can incorporate this into our classrooms. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to put my slides back up, and let's talk through the, um, the idea of how this works. Um, I had a... Uh, Mina said in the, um, or Mina, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, says, I'd love more information about playing in Spanish. And yes, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what it was like in my own classroom. And um, so I'll share some of that with, with you all. So with that said, let's go ahead and look through some of this. And by the way, like I said earlier, as I'm talking about anything, and if I've got it up on the screen, feel free to drop things into the comments um, with your own experiences or with your questions or with um, other resources or whatever. Let's kind of do this whole presentation all together, not just from me. Now, when we get to this point in the, um, we get to this point in the presentation, uh, we've played the mystery Skype game. And so you kind of get the idea behind it. It's a global guessing game um, that the students ask questions back and forth, yes and no, yes and no. There's lots of things that we can talk about, but one of the big questions that people always really want to know, this is like the key question that they want to get an answer to, and that is, where can you find people? Where can you find classes to um, interact with? I actually saw a little bit of chatter about this in the, uh, in the chat earlier, uh, we had some folks talking about this. So I'll pull that in in just a second too. But I wanted to start off by sharing my absolute favorite resource for finding video call partners. And that is the Skype in the Classroom website, which you can find at skypeintheclassroom.com. And the thing I love about this is this. This website is not just a sort of theoretical, hypothetical website that tells you, oh, you could do this and oh, you could do that. This is a database. It is a database of thousands of teachers around the world who want to get their class connected with classes like yours. It also is a database of hundreds of virtual guest speakers that want to talk to your students and also dozens of virtual field trips. And the neat thing about that is that with many of those out there, um, with many of those, they will play a mystery Skype game with you. Looking in the chat real quick, here's Nikki. She says, I use Skype in the classroom, but found most educators from Twitter. That's interesting. 
Let's touch on Twitter in just a second. I wanted to show Skype in the classroom real fast, but then let's definitely talk about it because I found a lot of folks to um, Skype with on Twitter as well. So with that in mind, let's do this. Let's go to skypeintheclassroom.com. So you can kind of see what this is. Um, and by the way, if you want to pop open another tab on your device and kind of scan through this yourself, that might be kind of fun. So this is the website, skypeintheclassroom.com, which is actually just a redirect to education.skype.com. So really either one of those will, will take care of it for you. So this is what it says, a free global community that fosters empathy and compassion for each other and our planet. Doesn't that sound like a, uh, a mission statement that we can all get behind? And so you'll find on the Skype in the Classroom website, you'll find that it has a spot for virtual field trips. Here's the Classrooms and Mystery Skype button. We're gonna click on that in just a second. There's the guest speaker sessions. So this is where you can find guest speakers to talk to your students. There are collaborative projects, um, curated projects and lessons that you can do with classrooms around the world. There are themed collections. It says live lessons around themes like literacy, conservation, animals, and more. And then there are even special events. I know lots and lots of teachers, um, especially in the upper elementary grades, um, do stuff with um, Jane Goodall and chimpanzees and Gombe National Park and you know all of, all of that Tanzania. Um, there are some neat special events, including one that Jane Goodall does. I think pretty much every year that you can that you can jump into. So that's kind of the meat and potatoes of the Skype in the Classroom website. Now let's click on the mystery Skype part and let's see what we can find. See, this is the thing that I love is that there are so many possibilities here and you can search them if you have a specific keyword that you wanna search. Um, but then you can also narrow it down. Like if you're working, I was working with high school kids. So I figured if I brought it up to about 13 or so, 13 to 18 plus, that would cover my, stu my students. And then duration of session, if you want it to be a short one or a long one, you can kind of do that. So it's got all of these different filters that you can use. You can even filter by subject too. And so you can see there's computer science, there's gaming, there's language learning, physical health and wellness, science, special education, world languages, so on and so forth. And so this is the classrooms and mystery Skype section. So this is the one where I should be able to find um, connections for my class. And I love to just look at the places that these are from. <clears throat> We've got Medford, Oregon here in the United States. We've got the Netherlands. We've got Israel, we've got Brazil, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. My aunt and uncle used to live in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, India, United Kingdom, Atlanta, Georgia. And see, some of these are focused in more on a specific theme, but then some of them are just classrooms. Like this is a classroom in Jacksonville, Florida. And this is a classroom in Valencia, Spain. Ah, Valencia, Spain. I have a story to tell you about that later. <laughs> And so if you click on one of these classrooms, like for instance, we'll see um, that this one, this is a classroom of 11 to 14 year old um, students. And so if we click on this classroom, we get to see a little bit of information that the teacher has shared. On Fridays, our middle school offers an activity session. Students in this group only meet once a week. They'd like to participate in mystery Skype activities. <clears throat> Excuse me with either other classrooms or individuals, we are newbies, but we're excited to collaborate. So they gave you that information. And then if you decide that this is a, um, a good class for you to get connected with, then you can click on that button. Now you do need to have a Skype or Microsoft account. So you, know, you can click to sign in. I'm gonna try to get signed in real fast and see if, um, if I can show you what it looks like. And so then it asks you for your contact information. So there's that, there's my email. I could put a separate contact e email, a location. Oh no, this is for me to register. Okay, I must have read, I think I registered with another Skype account. So anyway, basically all you do here is you just follow the instructions and, and you're there. So um, let's see. So anyway, once you've done that, then you're able to um, you're able to make contact, and then that's a that really is 
a very easy way for you to find other classes to, to be able to join. Um, can you use a personal Skype account? Yes, absolutely. In fact, that's the way that I used it um, for the longest time was I just created a Skype account and then I just used that. So it doesn't, I don't think it has to be anything that's, um, that is provided by your school. Uh, Christina in the chat says, to get students familiar with working in shared documents, I can see pairs of students doing a mystery Skype, kind of like Battleship, but remotely and digitally using the map to record. That sounds like a really interesting idea. Um, and shared documents can be a really big part of these. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but um, I really like that idea of having almost like a Battleship game, and then they can kind of go back and forth, back and forth. I guess, you know, I've actually heard people say that Mystery Skype is kind of like a cross between 20 questions and Battleship. If you've ever played the game Battleship before, um, 20 questions and Battleship is, is kind of the, the way that it works. So um, anyway, this is definitely one great place to go to find some stuff. But um, like Nikki said earlier, she said, um, I found most educators on Twitter. So let's go to, I want to show you one specific Twitter hashtag, the mystery Skype, if I could spell Skype, <laughs> the mystery Skype one. Oh, Laura says, or guess who? You could do a guess who game instead of a battleship game. Yeah, that would totally work. Totally love, I love both of those ideas. Okay, so if you do Twitter and following or basically checking out the mystery Skype hashtag, is a really great way to find other educators who use um, Skype or other video calls um, within this kind of an activity. Um, it's also interesting to see what other people are doing because a lot of times people will post to this hashtag um, with what they're doing in their classes. Um, but then also you'll get requests. So, um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to find a request here, but sometimes you'll see like fourth grade class wanting to, oh, look, there's another map. We were just talking about coloring in maps. And apparently there, okay, so here's a request. Any of my PLN, my personal learning network, located in a non-shaded state, wanna do a mystery Skype, let me know. So you look around and they, you know, these are the the places that that John's class has been. And so he's looking for other ones. Um, so anyway, you continue to scroll down through here and you can see some of these activities. But then you also do sometimes get to see um, requests and that's an easy way. Oh, look, there's our session right there. <laughs> um, but that's also a really easy way to meet other people and um, and you can also make your own request out here too. Um, I'm curious to see anybody that's in the session here, if there are any tips that you have for finding people on Twitter uh, to be able to do mystery Skype calls with. Nikki says, I would reach out to teachers in states that posted and ask them if they'd like to connect. Yeah, absolutely. So for instance, you could take this one tweet right here. This is from Mrs. McCabe. She says, we had fun playing mystery Skype with our new friends in Neosho, Missouri. And so what you might do is you might even find Mrs. McCabe and go follow her. Or maybe you would just write her a tweet and you would just say like, my class would love to do a, you could even use the hashtag if you want to, mystery Skype game with you. Let me know if you're interested and when you'd like to do it. And then you can hit that um, tweet button. I'm not actually gonna tweet it because I don't have a class of kids right now that, that would be doing that kind of, of mystery Skype, but you would hit tweet there and then just keep an eye on your notifications. And using Twitter really is a really great way to be able to do it. Nikki says, that's exactly what I did. I would post a request and I would reach out to people with a message or a D. DM. Yeah, the DM is a direct message, like one of these messages right here. So yeah, that could totally, totally work. Um, so let me show you another idea. And by the way, uh, continue if you're if you're watching this, if you have other um, things to share or questions to ask or whatever, feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, Nikki just said her goal was to get all 50 states. So I had to get creative when trying to find teachers to connect with. 
I've heard of lots of teachers that have tried to do that to get a mystery Skype game with all 50 states. And it is, it is a challenge from, from what I hear. So um, I want to show you another neat way to be able to find people to, um, to, to do these calls with. But before I do, Lori just dropped something in. What about Empatico? Yes, absolutely. Empatico.org. I'm so glad, Lori, that you brought this up because I always forget to mention this one. This is so good. So take a look at their mission. Empatico is a free tool that connects classrooms around the world. Sign up for free. Watch the video. Um, it empowers teachers and students to explore the world through experiences that spark curiosity, kindness, and empathy. We combine live video with activities designed to foster meaningful connections among students ages 6 through 11. So they do have that specific focus as far as the ages go. But this is a really good one. There's that sign up for free button right up there. And so this is a great way to get connected with other classes. Through video interactions, choose a partner class and schedule a connection foster meaningful connections with their research-based activities, amplify your students' voices. It's completely free, always will be. You sign up, you select a partner class, and then you get connected. Yeah, this is a good one. This is a very good one. Thank you so much, Lori, for, um, for sharing this. Um, so Mina was asking, basically then you just get the teacher's Skype ID and privately set up a Skype meeting with that teacher. No mystery Skype channels needed. Exactly, that's, that's basically, what you end up doing. Um, whether you connect here or if you find them on Twitter or if you go to the Skype in the Classroom website, that's basically what starts to happen is, um, is that, yeah, it really wants me to sign up. <laughs> but basically what happens is you get in contact with the other teacher and then you just swap information. And so you say, um, you know, here's my Skype ID. Let me get your Skype ID. Let's get connected. And then we'll get connected at a certain time and date. Um, there are some other suggestions too, like doing a practice call ahead of time and keeping an eye on your time zones. We're going to get to all of that a little bit later in the, in the presentation. And yeah, Nikki makes the point you can make, you can use in any video platform. And that's totally true. Um, I know some places I've gone, um, they don't have access to Skype, but they do have access to like Google Meet, for instance, or they might have access to Zoom. And so with a lot of these places, um, with a lot of these places, you're able to, um, you know, just get in contact with them and say, hey, I may not have access to Skype, but I can use Zoom. Are you okay with that? Um, Ooh, we got a couple of good good points coming in here in the chat. So Mr. Saisayana, again, uh, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that, says, unfortunately, Google's connected classrooms went away with Google Plus and some folks moved to Facebook. And so he shared this Facebook group, which is a which appears to be a really good one. Um, I'm going to put it up here on the screen. Um, and there are lots of lots of groups all over the place. This one's called Connected Classrooms with 671 members. Um, and so it's just a way to post to search for classrooms and to connect. And so you can um, ask to join that group. Liz says, um, I am concerned about the confidentiality of students. When we use this platform, do we need to ask permission before or from the parents before doing it. Okay, a couple of things on that. Um, you certainly could. I mean, I'd say if you ever have any concerns with that and you want to make sure that you are totally, totally covered, it wouldn't hurt to ask for that That um, as far as that goes. There are a couple of other ways to do it. Um, for instance, I know a lot of times whenever people do these video calls, um, you know, like a mystery Skype call, what they what they may do is they may have all their students behind them or they may point the camera at this group of students all sitting together. If it's a face to face classroom, obviously that's going to be a challenge going forward. Um, but what you could do is you could have the camera pointed at you at the teacher and then have the students sitting back behind. That's not nearly as much fun. But if you do need to keep um, all of your students off the camera, that is one way to still do it while maintaining confidentiality. Um, another way to do it is if your school has release forms that are signed at the beginning of the year, if you have a handful of students that um, or maybe just one or two students uh, who are not supposed to be on um, video, 
you would always always have them sit just a little farther off to the side so that they're not on camera. But another thing to think about with all of this is that a Skype call is a uh, is basically a two way video call. And so this isn't like broadcasting live on Facebook or YouTube. This isn't like um, having the camera crew come in from the local TV station and do something that everybody's going to see. This is kind of like, a, you know, it's almost like almost like closed circuit to some extent. It's like there's there's just a very small number of people that are there. So, um, you know, that's that's another thing to keep in mind. And, of course, something that you could communicate to um, to parents as well. So. Yes, this video call is recorded. Um, oh, Christina asked, is the video call recorded so it could be reproduced? There are certain um, there are certain tools that you can use to record. For instance, um, you know, if you did it over uh, Microsoft Teams, which is what we're using for this webinar, there is a recording feature within that. There are other video call platforms that do have recordings, and so you could certainly record them if you want to. I know for Skype, in particular, there is um, the Skype call recorder. And so with the Skype call recorder, um, that will allow you to record the call and be able to watch it again later. Uh, it's not actually natively part of Skype, but it's something that you can add. So yeah, variety of different ways that, that you can get at that. Okay, let's keep moving. Because um, we talked about where you can find people and we touched on that a variety of things. In fact, you know what? There's one other thing that I wanted to show you when it comes to finding people. I thought this was brilliant. So um, this idea came from uh, Diane Smokorowski, who's an educator in Kansas. She's a Skype master teacher. I'm actually a Skype master teacher too. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, but she was one of the original ones. And she came across this really neat trick to be able to find people uh, to do video calls with. Now, of course, you could always just ask people in your community or you could just, you know, do web searches and be able to find people. But um, here's what she suggested. She suggested that you go into a web search and you type type in what I'm going to show you right here. Site colon Twitter dot com space. And then you type in the kind of person that you're looking for. <laughs> you can see that I've done this before because the example I always give is an entomologist. Um, so like, you know, if you're looking for someone who can talk to your students about insects, let's, let's just use that as an example. Now, what's neat about this is if you do a web search, no matter what kind of search engine you're using, if you use this site operator at the beginning, site colon twitter.com, this is going to narrow you down to just results from that website. So in this case, just results with, um, with Twitter. And then whenever you search entomologist, this is going to search for, this is going to search through people's profiles, um, you know, kind of like their bio that they wrote about themselves. And so what's neat about this is if you click on this, or if you click on um, some of the results that you get, you may be able to find some people who are active on Twitter. And the reason we might want to look for people who are active on Twitter is because they're the ones that are most likely to be able to respond back and say, yes, I'd be glad to do a video call with you. So for instance, look at the first one, ask an entomologist at bug questions. <laughs> That sounds like a perfect example of who we might want to have our students get in contact with. So we click through on this one and we take a look. Real entomologists answer your questions about bugs. Shoot us a question below. That sounds fantastic. Now, if I scroll down a little bit, it looks like they've been active as recently as um, 14 hours ago. 14 hours ago. So that does mean that you've got a pretty decent chance of getting connected with them. So what you might do, especially since they asked for questions, is you might do a um, tweet to them. And so just, you know, a tweet with their Twitter handle at the beginning like this, and then just, you know, make your request and see if you can get through with them. Um, it never hurts to be persistent too. So continually, you know, following up with with your requests. Um, Jennifer suggests using filters in a web search to find people who have been active in the last month. That's a good one. Um, could I post the search in the chat? Yes, absolutely. 
Um, so the search that I was suggesting was site colon twitter.com. And I'm just going to put the word entomologist in there. So that's what you want to search site colon twitter.com. Um, and then search for whoever you want to search for. And so that was the one that I learned from Diane um, that I thought was a, was a fantastic idea. So anyway, with that being said, let's switch back over to the slides. So we talked, we sort of talked in, um, you know, in detail about where you can find people. Um, and one other thing I would say about finding people is that even if you think it's someone who's out of reach, you know, who would definitely say no, you never know until you ask. And my friend Todd is a good example of this. Um, my friend Todd teaches a social studies elective class. Now, the name of this social studies elective class might sort of ruin your day. So just just be prepared, okay? He teaches a social studies elective class called, ready for this? The History of the 80s. Does anybody else see something very, very wrong with a class being called the History of the 80s? It's like the 80s feel like it just happened, you know? It was, it was not that long ago. Um, and Nikki's like, stop, I was born in the 80s. I was born in 1980, so I'm right there with you. Um, yeah, so it seems like there can't be a history class, but there is. And of course, there are no textbooks for the history of the 80s. So he just started reaching out to um, to some of the luminaries of the 80s and asking, hey, would you do a video call with my class? We're studying the 80s. It would be a perfect fit. You would be amazed at some of the people that he got. If you've ever heard of the Cosby show before, popular sitcom in the 80s, Malcolm Jamal Warner was one of the stars of the show. And he came on and talked with Todd's kids just because he asked. Um, there was MTV during the 80s. And the video jockeys, the VJs, um, two of the original VJs, um, Mark Goodman and Alan Hunter, agreed to come uh, on a video call with Todd's students just because he asked. In fact, Todd was able to get Mike Arruzzioni, who was the captain of the 1980 U.S. men's hockey team that won the gold, defeated the Russians, um, it was the subject of the movie Miracle on Ice. Um, the captain of that team comes on every single year into that history of the 80s class just because Todd asked. So I only share, I share that story with you just because, um, just because you never know until you ask and it never hurts to ask. So, okay. So anyway, let's move on past finding people and let's get into some more of the basics. Um, like what can students learn? I mean, there's a lot of things that, that this is really good for. It's of course good for problem solving skills. Kids get to collaborate and communicate with each other. Um, you know, there's, there's some critical thinking. There are lots of good conversations that can happen before the call and after the call. Um, you've got geography skills and your regular mystery Skype. So there's lots of things that kids end up learning. Um, for my own particular students or my own students in my own class, it was also a language learning exercise and a, an opportunity to broaden their worldview. And so this, this is the old pixely screenshot that I've held on to for years. And these students up here in the top left were my Spanish three students. And this right here is a class of students in Valencia, Spain, who are about the same age. And we got um, we got those those classes together on uh, to start off on a mystery Skype call. Um, the teacher in Spain had never done a mystery Skype call. I had never done one before. And so we got our classes together and we did this call. And this is a screenshot from it. We went back and forth, back and forth. We eventually guessed they were in Spain. They eventually guessed we were in the United States. And then we spent about 15 or 20 minutes at the end, just asking each other questions we were curious about. Like we would ask, what do you have for dinner? What kind of shoes do you wear? Um, what kind of sports do you like? You know, just different things like that, that they were, they were curious about. And they got to get answers to all those questions. Now, after that mystery Skype call, I got on the email with the, the teacher in Valencia, Spain, and we were like, whoa, we have something really cool here. We can't stop just with this. 
And so what we decided to do was we started doing these regular video calls. And for those of you that are asking about how to do this in a world language class, this is how I did it. But this, of course, could cross over to other classes too. The way that we did it was I had um, – I had my students into, I put my students into groups of two. And so it was pairs and it was two kids from my class in the United States, two kids from the class in Spain, and they would get onto a video call. Each group, each pair had its own Skype account. That was the easiest way for us to do it. And so each group had their own Skype account. So this one would call that one. And we did it once a week. And I would spend an entire class period once a week doing these calls. And um, so each group of two was on with another group of two. So, you know, there were like multiple groups all over the room and each one was calling their group over in Spain. And here's how the class looked. It was uh, my kids. Um, well, it was, it was my kids and the kids in Spain, of course, right? Um, so for the first 15 minutes, we would talk in English. The teacher from Spain and I, we would come up with some discussion questions. And so we would um, you know, we would front load them with those discussion questions. And so um, we got to ask the kids in Spain questions in English. They got to respond. And then my kids got to coach them on their English, which was something they had never done before. Coach other kids their age in English as a second language. It was a pretty cool thing. And um, then for the next 15 minutes, my kids would um, – answer questions in Spanish from the kids in Spain. They would ask the questions we would answer, and then they would coach us on their Spanish. And then for the last 15 minutes of class, my students just got to hang out with the kids in Spain on a video call for 15 minutes and just talk about whatever they wanted to talk about. And um, that was probably the coolest part of the whole thing because my students got to have real honest to goodness interactions with kids from another country. And we live in a very rural place where most of my students have not left our county, let alone the, um, the country. And so many of them probably never would leave the country, but they had that um, authentic connection um, with, my, with these kids in Spain. And um, that was something that I could have never given them any other way. And so that's, that's part of the reason that I'm such a huge proponent of that. Um, <laughs> Nikki writes so powerful having them actually practice and have relevant conversations and they built authentic relationships. And that is huge. Yes. I totally agree with that. That was the thing I loved about it is that we kept going back to it for about two months. We would do these weekly calls. And so, you know, over two months they got to do seven or eight calls with each other. Mina just asked, how did I work this out with the time zones? And I'm so glad that you asked this. Um, so it just worked, happened to work out perfectly with us. Because um, with us, uh, my Spanish three class started at 10.15 Eastern time. And the kids in Spain, their last class of the day started at 4.15 p.m. And there was a six-hour time difference. So it worked out just, just right. Um, however, it doesn't always work out that way. So with the time zone, there are a couple of ways around it. One is if you can get a place that has um, – if you can get a class – that has a similar time zone to you or the number of hours they're ahead or behind works out, then that's great. And that's no big deal. Um, another strategy I've used is go North or go South, because if you go North or you go South, that's still in the same time zone. And so for me, that meant that, you know, if I'm looking for places where they speak Spanish, it's easier to go, you know, down into South America for me than it is to go over into Pacific time in California. Um, so th those are some, those are some things to think about. Um, another thing you could do is you don't even have to do this synchronously on a live video call. You could use a tool like Flipgrid where students can record asynchronously, which means they record a video for others to watch later. And then they're even able to reply back to each other with a video response. That didn't exist when I was doing this in my own class, but um, that is an easy way to get a similar experience without having to battle the time zones. So um, I'm so glad that you brought that up. That was, that was, a, good, that was a good point. Um, so let's keep moving. I talked about how there were alternative mystery Skype games. And so I want to throw a couple of these out to you. And of course, you know, these can be as wide and as varied as you want them to be. Um, 
because the traditional mystery Skype game is a geography Skype. So that's one where you're guessing where they are geographically. But there are different ways to be able to ask yes and no questions to another class to be able to do this. Um, for instance, there's the mystery animal Skype. My friend Mike Soskel, who is also a Skype master teacher, um, used to do this with his students. And he would do a mystery animal Skype before he taught them about animal classifications, which is kind of cruel, but it's very effective. <laughs> and so he would say he would get his class on with another class and they would do these um, they would do these mystery animal Skype games and they would just try to guess, you know, does your animal have fur? Does it have four legs? Um, does it have a tail? Does it swim? Does it, you know, all of these things. And it was really hard. And eventually his students would come to him and be like, oh, Mr. Soskel, this is tough. There's got to be an easier way to be able to narrow down these animals, isn't there? And he's like, ah, uh, I have them in the palm of my hand right where I want them. He's like, yes, actually there is. Let me teach you about animal classifications. So in that case, he triggered the need in his students before he taught it to them, which I thought was brilliant. So um, mystery animal Skype is one way to do it. Mystery number Skype. This is a good one for younger kids um, because they can guess and they can pick a number and then they can ask each other questions like, is it an even number? Is it bigger than five? Um, you know, you can, there, there's a wide variety of things that you can do with that. Um, and Nikki says she did mystery number with second graders and they loved it. Um, Lori asked the question, could you connect with a zoo or an aquarium? Yes, absolutely. In fact, if you go to Skype in the classroom.com and you look under virtual field trips, there are a handful of them that you could always check out. And some of them are even willing to play a mystery Skype with you, or you could just do the virtual field trip either way. Um, so there's also, I've seen, um, music classes do mystery instrument Skype where there's a, you know, they pick an instrument. And then they say, you know, is it a woodwind or is it a brass or does it have valves or does it have strings or, you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, those are just a few of the alternatives and you could continue to, you know, innovate. It doesn't just have to be one of those. When you're playing a mystery Skype game, this is an important thing to think about is what do you want your students to be doing when the game happens? Because if you have them all clumped into one group and you start the call, you may find the 80-20 rule. I think they call that Pareto's principle that says that 80% of people do 20% of the work, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. You will find that a handful of kids will start doing all of the things and the other ones will probably sit back and watch. But if you assign jobs to students, then all of a sudden it becomes um, – it becomes this big, um, it's, it's almost like, I, I like to think of it like gears, like the gears of a clock all turning and the cogs all turning all in the background because everybody has a job and everybody's doing part of the process. So you may have a greeter who is on camera when it starts and uh, introduces themselves and may say something about their school without giving away the location. You have the question askers who stay on camera and they're the ones who ask the questions. You may have an answer logger who is somebody who logs the answers to the questions that you ask to help them be able to help the students be able to figure out what to ask next. You may have a mapper, some, you know, a student or a couple of students who have a map out who are helping try to figure out what the next questions will be. The question answerers are the ones who stay on and they're the ones that answer the questions that come in. A runner could be somebody who takes one thing over to another person. <laughs> I made up the word goodbye -er, cause all of my other ones had er at the end of it. Um, the one who, um, does the, the final goodbye. Um, and then in my class as a Spanish class, we always had translators because, um, every once in a while a class would ask a question in Spanish and there would be a word we didn't know. So we had to ask the translators to go look it up. So. Um, those are some of the things that you can do with students when it comes to that. There's a question in the chat about please share the recording link and presentation. The links are available at q.org slash Microsoft. Um, so I think I mentioned that earlier. I'm going to put it back in the chat. So um, you should be able to get the recordings there. All right. 
a couple more things as we wrap up. These are a couple of just quick tips. Uh, we talked about the time zones earlier. Um, I also have found that sometimes time zones change. So, um, so what you can do, or one thing that you might want to do is to ask them if they have a time zone change coming up. I missed out on our final video call with the kids in Valencia, Spain, because the time zone changed in, um, in the, um, in Spain and, and we didn't get to do it. So, um, do a practice call. This is another good suggestion. Um, if you're supposed to, uh, get connected with those other class on a Wednesday and maybe on Monday or Tuesday, you do a quick call with the other teacher, just with it, with the teachers and just check your audio and your video and make sure that you know what's going on. I really like these next two prepare students for the call and do a debrief afterward. See, um, whenever the, whenever the students kind of know what's coming to some extent and the, they know what the norms and the expectations are that can help. But then afterwards, these calls can be such great learning moments, learning opportunities. And so don't miss out on that learning opportunity by just moving on to the next thing after the call's over. Take some time to debrief. Ask them what they thought. Ask them what they learned. Ask them what they think about what they heard. Um, and maybe even plan some special follow-up activities that, that go along with it. And that kind of leads into that last one. Use it to prompt new activities and lessons. So um, if you're willing to be flexible and to kind of like invent something on the fly after the activity happens, you can come up with some really cool stuff. And then there are um, follow-up lessons that you can do. I'll just breeze over these real quickly. We talked about Flipgrid videos. Um, there are street view maps and satellite maps where you can look at the location of the person you just called. You can always work together in an online document. So if you have like a shared Microsoft Word document online and you share it with the other class or with a small group of the, um, a small group of kids, then they're able to work together in that document. Um, I always thought it was cool to, um, if you can get your two classes together to benefit somebody else, to do like a service project together. Um, or you could have students present together to the other class via video call. So there are lots of things that you can do to kind of follow up. So as we kind of wrap this up, I wanted to give you this one last thing. Um, if you love these ideas and are looking for more practical things that you can bring into your classroom, I have something for you. Um, these are three free eBooks that you can get on my website, um, which you can get at ditchthattextbook.com slash 101. So if you go there, you can get signed up for my email newsletter. And while you do that, you also get these three free eBooks with lots of ideas. They've got downloadable templates. You can download them and um, you can assign them straight to your students. So if you're interested in getting that kind of stuff and a pipeline of new ideas into your inbox once a week, ditch that textbook.com slash 101 is where you want to go. So that sort of wraps things up here. This has been a lot of fun interacting with y'all. Thank you so much for the great comments in the chat. Um, thanks for coming. Um, again, q.org slash Microsoft is the place to go to get um, to get the video recording if you want to watch this one or any other one, really. Um, that's where that recording will be. So this has been fun. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope I get to see you on another session. Take care. Be safe. I'll see you later.